Hello, this is Robin Cousins at the Garrick Theatre in Chicago. In fact, it's our penultimate week, but I'm here having tea with Wilma. Um, even though I'm probably best known as the Olympic gold medalist for figure skating, a lot of people don't know that my first love was theatre. And as a five and six year old dancing classes, gymnastic classes, I wanted to be Gene Kelly and I wanted to dance with Sid Charisse. And um, Sing in the Rain uh, was, is probably one of my favourite films of all time, still is. Great theatre production as well. Um, but for me, probably the, the greatest dance movie of all time has got to be An American in Paris. Um, so my love of theatre was always part of my skating background and my training. Um, I was always the performer first and the competitor second. And then um, through skating, I was asked to get involved in a production of Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella at the Muni in St. Louis in America, where they were going to present the show um, in Victorian England. And the Cinderella ball was going to be an ice ball. Much the same as Victoria and Albert used to have at the old Grosvenor House here in London. Uh, so I ended up um, working with the director and then auditioning and ended up playing the prince as well. And that was my first foray into musical theatre um, as a proper, legit performer. Believe it or not, performing on stage with Adolph Green and Phyllis Newman as my parents in the show. And of course, Adolph Green wrote what? Singing in the Rain. So it sort of came full circle, and um, I knew that fate had to be involved, and uh, the bug stuck then, and it still sticks now. I was very fortunate enough, not long before he died, to meet the great Gene Kelly. So I have a photograph which I brought from my house at home, and it's sitting behind you on the dressing room there. And that's what I look at before I step out onto stage as Billy Flynn, is that he is sort of the inspiration to have that power and that knowledge, but to be relaxed enough that it's just, I'm just going to work and doing my job. Um, because my theory was that Astaire was so put together and rehearsed within an inch of his life and always looked, to me it always looked like that, whereas Gene Kelly looked like he was making it up as he went along and there was something spontaneous, and yet the precision was still perfection. Um, so I've always, he's always been a, a guiding light for me in terms of choreography and watching things and the way he performed as, as a performer on us. And I'm taking that a little bit with me now and I step onto stage. I saw the original Chicago in 1975, 74, 75 it would have been. Um, and it was amazing then and just, you know, being wowed by the cast. But then there's something about the way it's been paired back now. There isn't a word in the show that doesn't need to be said. There's nothing extraneous that is spoken or sung. And every word has a purpose. And it's, it's one of those that, yes, it zips by very quickly, but that's why. There's nothing extraneous to the production. It gets to its point and to its heart very quickly and very succinctly. And I think that's something that's very important in musical theatre. We love to be entertained. We love to be taken out and, and have all this stuff wash over us. But sometimes you get taken away for 15 minutes of extraneous fabulousness and then you have to bring yourself back to the reason for the show um, and those shows are wonderful and they're great but there's something about something like a Chicago that is, has been paired back to its bare bones of perfection. The piece I love is in the middle of act two where the show kind of comes to its head around the whole point of the show when he finally has had enough with Roxy and he's, he tells her as it is um, you're a has-been you're a celebrity, a phony celebrity kid. In a couple of weeks, nobody will know who you are. That was true then, it's true now, and it will be continued to be true for those people that are seeking their 50 minutes of fame in 25 years' time, which is why a show like this will never go out of fashion. Because sadly, there will always be somebody who thinks that that 15 minutes of fame is worth whatever else they are likely to put online and lose, at whatever cost. And I think that's the sad part. Um, with, I talked to the director about my, my take on Billing, uh, and, and I feel that Roxy is very much, the, it's like having the puppy dog. They just need to be reined in, and you give them the information, and they'll learn, and they'll go to the next level, and then they'll learn the next bit. But there are always these puppies that never learn. They never get it. And she doesn't. And at one point, she actually calls him something that he is, probably knows in his head, but has never called himself, and that's a greasy mick lawyer. And whilst nobody will ever know how he lives, they know how he, what he lives by, and his facade is very important to him. So um, I, I love the singing, dancing, and doing razzle, and having choreography and all that, but the scene, those two scenes with Roxy um, are probably two of my favorite moments in the show. I love the challenge that Sarah puts me in every night, 
um, even though she's been doing it for a while, it's just so always so ripe with her every show, every performance. And Tony Timberlake I did Cats with many years ago, um, and is adorable, and he's a lovely, lovely Amos. And uh, you don't want to mess with Yaz, <laughs> the lovely Mama Morton. So no, it, it's, it's really been good, and I think the nice thing for this particular cast, everybody that's in it, um, other than Tony and myself, had done it before, either at the Cambridge or even at the Adelphi, but never together. So it's, it's, it's got a fresh feel about it, but everybody knows it. And it's an older cast, and it's a very honest cast, and I like that. A, a chameleon it would be one. Open, honest. Um, if you don't want to know the truth, don't ask me the question. Um, but I suppose the most important thing is that um, I like to think I'm fairly courteous. I like to think that I would speak to other people the way that I would expect to be spoken to myself. I think Roxy is a great number. It follows me, I just come off stage and I get to watch. And it's again, it's, it's storytelling within the lyrics. There's great setup for her. You get to learn exactly who she is and what she's about and why she's doing what she's doing and why she's done what she's done in her mind. And it makes perfect sense. Um, and it is, it's just one of those wonderful little moments that it's a story within itself. You get to know what's happened, what's going on, where she wants to be, what's next, as a result of one great number. Personally, I do enjoy Reach for the Gun. I do have fun with that. Um, and having done it with all three Roxies now, it's, it's great, because everybody has a different, a different flavour for it. But then I would be churlish for me not to say that I love doing Razzle Dazzle because I get to dance a bit. There's actual we there is choreography that has been done for me and it's it's and it matches and again it's it's him being the magician and making things happen within with all the other choreography and I hadn't realised that he is a magician in his own mind as a lawyer but in the number he's a magician because he com he he makes all the action happen with the ensemble on stage, and they don't make a move that he hasn't orchestrated or isn't making happen with a gesture of some kind or just thinking about. So that's kind of fun. And it... I know I said I, I, Tenardier is a, is a character role that I, I'm sort of feeling that I'm coming to <laughs> the age of my life. Um, that would be a great one to, to be, again, another challenge in a way that to take a character into another into a level for me personally, um, but I'm I'm I wouldn't even mind finding something to do that didn't involve song and dance that actually had had a, a character actor whether it's a bit of comedy or or straight acting. I'm, I'm playing a serial killer or somebody that is so opposite now, having having got the chops around the dialogue and the words with the show like this and really sort of been pushed. Um, I quite like that idea of. Of playing, but I want, I'm game for anything. That's me. I'm, I'm I'm up for choices. I'm not up for putting myself into things that I know I'm not capable of doing or or allowing myself. I, I do think that it's very important that that people tell you what you need to hear, not what they think you want to hear. I mean, I think it has to be a really great show for 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 comebacks, and there are some great shows, and there are great shows that deserve to to be revived every seven or eight years or or sooner, maybe some of them. But I think it's lovely that maybe more so here, certainly through the fringe, there's some other shows that are getting to be tested. I think we're I think we're in a good space. I think it is it is good that we have fresh material coming in. And there is a reason why the long runners are long runners. And they are great shows. And if they continue to bring people into the West End and into live theatre that aren't normally seeing it. Um, then that's great because hopefully that will then push them to see something that they wouldn't normally go after and that they will, having seen a Les Mis or a Phantom, think, well, what's London Road about? Let me go and see that. And go with a bit of an open mind and go with a realisation that not everything is about, you know, extravagance and, and glitz and glamour. You know, there are some great pieces out there that demand your focus and attention. Um, and, I, and I like that about British, British theatre general, whether it's musicals or plays or... or performance pieces. I think we, we have a much stronger fringe now than we than we had in the past. It's not only about the West End. I think it, it's great that that we are in a position now where you can have 
great fringe work that has no pretense to come into the West End or be a West End show. It's a fringe show, and it's a damn good one. Um, yeah. I did get to watch not as much as everybody else. We were running in between crew rooms and stage door televisions and you know to catch what was going on. I did have day duties as part of the TG Best Ambassador program which I was on and working with the Synchro Swim Girls. So my own nerve wracking experience in the second week um, with the girls that they did a fantastic job in, and were above target on what they needed. Great young talent, hungry and eager to learn which was great for me to, to play, literally to play with and and throw ideas at. Um, and then I was in the gymnastics um, arena when our two boys won the silver and bronze on the pommels. I was there for their um, uh, medal win, a bronze medal win. Mm, close not to be knocked out of that silver medal position. But again, it's that, that whole, the thing that I can connect with, with the gymnastics aspect of. But again, I, I just love walking around London and seeing people so buzzed by the volunteers and, and the whole, I mean, I mean, it's becoming a bit of a cliche now, but we all, we, a lot of people just kept coming out, people going, oh, it's going to be horrible, we're going to go to Grants instead of that. We were full here, we were busy, I don't know, they kept saying, West End's empty, nobody's coming to the show, but well, they needed to come and watch us, because other than opening night ceremonies, where we were probably about 70%, the rest we've been pa packed, and it's been busy. In the West End, I walk back, come into the, it's been full, so, you know, it has been great and I and I think just again the buzz around London um, and throughout the whole country once the, the games hit the TV screens was great and I'm looking forward to more of the same in the coming two weeks for Paralympics well conversely people say well I paid my money to sit there you, you do your performance and I'll sit and watch it how I want to sit and watch it there was a time again I'm of that age I was a time when people used to get dressed up to go to the theatre you had a jacket or you you know now people come directly from the shops and you know put the bags and they sit and they're having a sandwich or it's um if that's what they do and they love it people go oh god did you see those people just sitting just sitting there they're just sitting on their hands on this i said well maybe they're they're enough they're foreigners and it's taking them time to translate what we've said into their own language and by the time they've got it they go oh that's funny in their head we're on another scene who knows you have no idea the best news is they pay for that ticket that's paying for your salary. So regardless of what we think on stage, without those people sitting in the audience doing whatever they feel they want to do, you kind of do have to catch yourself. The phones, you can still hear them, you know, put, people put them on vibrate. No, turn it off. You know, if you are a doctor on call, I'm sorry. It's, you know, then you need to figure it out. But we know those things are out there and you try not to engage with them, then you can't connect with them as an audience. You're not going to bring them in unless you take yourself to them. So it's a, it's a bit of, it has to be a bit of a give and take thing. The ushers keep an eye on people if they're talking and you know, get people translating in their normal voice next to somebody, which is, I couldn't think of anything worse for somebody sitting next to somebody like that, but you know, maybe it's an audio translation that you could rent or something and, and get it in your ear as you do when you're walking around a museum or something. I mean, that's, who knows, maybe just, call, not something new. As a friend of mine says, the music will start, the music will end, and hopefully in between there may or may not be applause. The last show that I saw, well, I went to, I went back and saw Kim, his may do, Mamma Mia. Um, again, great feel-good show. It is um, one of those long runners that has struck a chord with its audience. And I was actually working with Ashley Van Last on a Holly Nice production at the time when Mamma Mia was very first being put together. And he was not convinced at the beginning. I don't think anybody was. Who knew what it was, how it was going to be received or taken? Um, so that, the, the last... I was um, end of the rainbow here, and then I was in New York recently, and I saw Tracy do it again there. It was even more mind blowing, and how that girl has the the body to do that. Well, I know I've known her for a long time to, to do that every night. Engrossing. Um, there's some great stuff out there. Um, I'm looking forward to having some time off. Maybe I'm going to see the new batch that's going to be coming in through the autumn, and um, go and visit some friends who are working. Fortunately.
playing West End for my musical song. It's not one that I would ever do, and I've mentioned it earlier, and I, and I think that the soliloquy from Carousel is, is a great number. It's a great piece. Um, again, I, I like the idea that it can be sung out of context. Um, and I've heard it sung by young people who are using it as an audition song. I've heard people attack it with, uh, with operatic voices, people sing it with West End voices, and it is, it's a hard piece to kill. It can be done badly, but it gets a hard piece to kill. But I think the soliloquy from Carousel is probably one of my favorite moments in a musical. I think it's a brilliantly crafted musical. Um, I've got a ticket, I'm gonna go and see it now, the Opera North version. Um, but I think that's, that's a wonderful piece.